empty praise I think that I deserve. Lord, I come to you and I confess nothing I desire compares. All is lost, all is lost in the shadow of the cross. Everything Welcome to Loving the World Online. 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 It's Mother's Day. We have a great service planned around Psalm 19. 
which describes God's glorious creation and his amazing word and the forgiveness that can come into our lives. We're gonna begin like we do with scripture and today from Psalm 19 and a time-lapse photography piece that just is astounding to me. It took a year to film. Watch Psalm 19. I'm Jaime Cortez, community pastor, and at this time, we want to take one minute to pray together. So wherever you are, if it's in your living room, if it's in your car, we want to invite you to take one minute to pray out loud. We want to pray for our leaders, we want to pray for the church, and we want to pray for the sick during this time. So take one minute and pray.
This is one of my annual traditions on Mother's Day to remind you, if you haven't gotten your cards, that I bought extra and I'm certainly willing to give them out to you. I'm going to put them over by where I parked my car by the yellow slide. So if you need to sneak by and grab one of these Mother's Day cards, just want you to know I'm here for you. So here we go. Moms, uh, we're glad that you're all gathered around your uh, TVs with your family. And I want to show you these Mother's Day cards. The first one, um, it kind of really jumped off the page at me because it looks like uh, what's been going on in Florida over the last few days as people have been getting out of, of uh, the lockdown and going out to the beaches. And it says at the top, can you spot the mom in this picture? It's kind of like a Where's Waldo picture. And on the inside, it says, of course not. She's still back at the car, unloading the beach towels, sunscreen, inflatable toys, ice chests, folding chairs, blanket, pails, and shovels, fold-up umbrellas, swim fins, and who knows what else. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, we just want to take a moment and say we know that you do a disproportionate amount of the work that makes everything work in our lives. We want to thank you for that. I really like this card. A good mom lets you lick the mixer. It was one of my favorite things. My mom, get me in the kitchen. Uh, we're doing some of the chocolate. On the inside, it says, a great mom turns it off first. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, we want to say thanks a lot for helping make our lives safer and protecting us. One of the great jobs that God gave you. Uh, this one has a little uh, crib, uh, kind of a little mobile hanging above it, and it says, Mom, you carried me inside you for nine months and went through excruciating pain for hours to have me. I got you this card. Kind of makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Happy Mother's Day. It's never going to be true that we're going to say enough. We're going to be able to clarify and tell you how much we appreciate what you've done for us and giving us life and taking care of us every day. Moms, you make a huge difference. Mom, you may think I've caused you a little stress over the years, but actually I've helped you out a lot, the card says. If you knew about everything I did, you'd be in an institution right now. Happy Mother's Day with love. Mom, we know that you've overlooked a lot in our lives. You've seen us at our worst and that you've still loved us Thanks for reminding us of what God's love looks like in that way. How about this one? Mom, sometimes I find myself doing things like you did, and it makes me smile. It's when I find myself doing things like Dad does that I get all freaked out. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, thanks for showing us a really great example, being an example to us all. Now, this last card I made myself. And it has a picture of some flowers that were given to my father just this last week. And on the inside, it says, no card can make this better, but I'm giving you one anyway. I know that on Mother's Day, there's a lot of people that are having a much harder day. It's joyful for lots, but for lots of people, it's really sad. Maybe you're sad today because your mom's not with you anymore. Maybe this holiday is just reminding you of a lot of grief. Maybe you're feeling really isolated and alone today, and you're feeling just a deep kind of depression right now. Maybe you come to this day and your arms are empty and you want to be a mom, and you're hurting today. I want to remind you today that God's got love for you no matter what you're feeling. And I want to pray for moms and for all those that are hurting today. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we celebrate and give thanks for our moms that gave us life, for moms that cared and nurtured and showed us the way. And God, we ask for help today because not all moms got it right, and some people are broken on this day by that. And there's people that are suffering in grief today from loss and loneliness and hurt, and we need your arms, God, to come and surround us and hold us and to cherish us today. So we ask God for your help, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys. Can I read to y'all some of my favorite Bible verses? Yes. Okay. We're going to read from Ephesians 3, 16 through 18. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So do you know why that's my favorite verse? Because it's my greatest wish for you, that you too will grow up to know God's love in your hearts and that you will feel his power like it says. Okay. And also when it says how wide and long and high and deep, do you know what it reminds me of? What? The Grand Canyon. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know how big the Grand Canyon is? Yes. Right. Yes. So like that is how much God loves you. Can you imagine that? Yeah. If his love were to fill the Grand Canyon, that's how much he loves you. That's what it reminds me of. And do you know what I like about that as well? Is that that's how much I love you too. Right there in your homes, I invite you to sing along with me. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing His Word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me.
When our boys were little, we spent most nights before bed reading books. I was so happy to get to introduce them to some of my old friends. We started with board books and worked our way through our huge collection. I loved reading Goodnight Moon with my boys and finding the little hidden mouse. I loved reading Are You My Mother? It was one of my favorites. My mom so loved listening to me read it. She once recorded me and kept it the rest of her life. I love those nights of parenting and miss them and those books. As the boys grew, we moved to chapter books, and when the time was right, we began to explore the transcendent worlds made so real by my favorite authors. I'll never forget Charlotte's Web, Wilbur and Templeton. I was so happy when we got to see us, Lewis. This was a dear friend. We read his amazing Chronicles of Narnia and fell in love with Aslan, Edmund, Lucy, Susan, the Beavers, and little Reepicheep. I've never recovered from his visions of heaven further up and further in. I had this wonderful teacher at Baylor, Dr. Wartman, in an old classroom on the top floor of the Armstrong Browning Library. The class was all about C.S. Lewis. Each week we read and discussed, and I learned about Lewis's struggle to find faith. I learned about his late marriage and the tragic death of his wife, Joy. One moment stands out to me. When he was a young boy, he touched the deepest real truth that God was present and reaching out to him in the world. He struggled for such a long time to find faith, but this moment never left him. My brother brought into the nursery the lid of a biscuit tin, which he had covered with moss and garnished with twigs and flowers so as to make it a toy garden or a toy forest. That was the first beauty I ever knew. We might have seen it as a kid's project to be thrown out, rocks, dirt, and sticks in a tin tray, but Lewis encountered beauty on that day. As far as he ran, as hard as he tried to ignore God, he kept being drawn back to that moment because it was the day he met God. Everything he wrote after that was imprinted by beauty and longing. He said, as long as I live, my imagination of paradise will retain some of my brother's toy garden. What are the voices that you hear in your head? Now I know that you might think that that makes a person crazy to hear voices, but I contend it's the voices I hear that keep me sane. I hear the voices of my grandfather who used to sit me in his lap and rock me and laugh and steal my nose and find coins in my ears and tell me that he loved me. And I hear the voices of my teachers who challenged me to be better. One day in my C.S. Lewis class, We had to turn in a research paper. It was the only way to get an A. The teacher came through the chairs collecting the assignment. He got to my chair and he waited. I was embarrassed and disappointed. I had no paper and the look on his face, anger, betrayal, tears. This was his favorite class to teach and I sat on the front row and I loved the discussion and I loved his class and I'll never forget the sound of his eyebrows. I hear the voices of my friends. I just have to close my eyes and I can hear Jay and Paul and Charles. I can hear the taunts of Craig and Paige and Jeff. And I have to focus my mind and try to shut out some of the voices, the ones that tear down and divide and condemn. But mostly, I hear the voice of my mom. She's the one that so often woke me in the morning and talked me through the day. She's the one who taught me to draw and see the world. She turned over leaves and looked at bugs. She taught me to love words and books and pictures and research, and she had lots of joy. I don't exactly talk with her, but she's frequently involved in my day. I see a bird, and I know that she would love that little wren. I comb my hair across my forehead, and I can feel the slight touch of her hand trying to get to the curl at the front of my head and get it to lie down flat. Occasionally, I'll pick up a book, and I find her name in it, and it'll take my breath away. The Bible is filled with moments when God speaks to people, sometimes like thunder, other times like a whisper. The difference is, are we listening? Today, I want you to slow down and listen to the voices. God's trying to speak to you. They're the whispers of God's presence in our lives and in our world. We're reading the book of Psalms at an accelerated pace. I've never done it this way before, reading three or four a day, and I love it. 
I love the roller coaster of emotions because it's the way I feel sometimes. Angry and frustrated, despondent and depressed, joyful and exuberant. Last Friday, we read Psalm 19, and it's one of my favorites. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after they continue to speak, night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made his home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its courses to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. One of my favorite verses is Proverbs 8, 32 through 36. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life, and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. And the reason this is one of my favorites is because God always makes his wisdom available to us. Psalm chapter 16 is one of my favorite passages of scripture in the Bible, especially verses 7 and 8. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. These are such reassuring verses because it gives me confidence to know that no matter what challenges I may face or no matter where I am, God is always right beside me. The man was dressed for the cold, jacket, coveralls, gloves. He was ready for an ice fishing trip. He knelt down to start carving a hole and he heard a voice. There are no fish under the ice. He spun his head around to see who was talking to him, but it was still dark. Maybe it was all in his head. He turned around again to the ice and he raised the pick. Again, the voice boomed. There are no fish under the ice. He stood up and he squinted into the darkness. Who's there? And the voice returned. The ice skating rink manager. We have to sort out the voices we're hearing. Psalms 19 tells us God is actively speaking to us. In verse 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that God is breaking into our world. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. They pour forth speech. They reveal knowledge. God's the creator of the world. He's built Himself into the world. And when you look, you'll see God. In particular, He's talking about the sun and moon, but it's as equally true about the plants and the flowers and the insects. The precision, beauty, and coordination of our natural world is an indication of the presence and ongoing energy of God in the world. Verse 3 tells us that these words are silent but clearly heard. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. The silent but clear presentation of God is what I would call awe. It's the moment that takes your breath away. 
Maybe you felt it on a dark night and you step out to see the stars. Your eyes adjust and you begin to see the Milky Way. And what comes out is a hush whisper. Wow, just the sound of exhaling. I've read scientists and theologians, but none have reached me as deeply as Norman MacLean's words, In a River Runs Through It. The movie came out in 1992. We had just moved to Spearman. It's about a preacher and his two boys who love the outdoors. I remember sitting at a dark theater and being overwhelmed by tears. It's a movie about the beauty of the natural word, God's words, and the ethical life. The movie, filmed in Montana, is filled with the raw beauty of the West, high, craggy mountains, fast-moving rock-filled streams, and golden light. When I see the mountains and that water, I feel inspired. Ten years later, we followed those images canoeing the Missouri River for four days. McLean says that the intricacies of nature draw us to God. My father, he wrote, believed that by picking up God's rhythms, we were able to regain power and beauty. That is what the psalmist says. Somehow, getting in contact with the pattern of the sunrise and the sunset, we connect to God. I think it's why I've chased the sunrise around the earth, dragging my family out of bed in the darkest hours and marching to high points to catch a glimpse of the rising sun. David says that this testimony of God is felt by people all over the earth. It's not reserved for a few, it's not the product of a teacher or a culture, but it's the raw, universal, and undeniable truth. Yet, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. My mother taught me about beauty. She was a painter, and when I was young, she took me to her art classes. She had me sit beside her, I watched her, I listened. She took me to museums and to national parks. She got on the ground and we searched for four-leaf clovers. We looked at flowers. We wrapped in blankets and watched the stars and listened as my dad explained the constellations and navigating by night. My mother taught me the words of Psalm 19 my whole life. God is showing himself to us in the world. A recent psychological study helps pinpoint the incredible gift she gave me. The scientists found that engagement with natural beauty correlates higher with being grateful, satisfied with one's life, spiritually transcendent, hopeful, and less materialistic. If you can listen to God's voice with the psalmist, it helps you be grateful. It helps you be more content and peaceful. It helps you see God more clearly. It helps shape your days by hope and causes you to depend less on the transitory, materialistic things of this world. If you want to hold on to Psalm 19, find some place beautiful. I'm sitting in Geneva Jaffa's beautiful garden, who so generously gave it to us so that we could come and listen to God's voice. Find a flower or a plant and listen to God. Go out tonight and stand and listen because God is shouting out to you. Welcome to the Yellow Chair interview today. I'm interviewing Kendra and Spencer. So Kendra, thanks so much for coming and joining us today. Thanks for having us. So uh, kind of introduce yourself to everybody. I'm Kendra Murray. Uh, Nate and I, my husband, we came here from California about five years ago. And we have three children now, um, two two-year-olds and him. He just and turned Spencer. one month today. So uh, you have twin girls. Tell I us do. just a little bit about their birth. When did that happen and kind of what was that about? They were born on Valentine's Day in 2018, um, almost eight weeks early. Uh, yeah. There was complications, so they were an emergency out in Dallas. Yeah. Um, spent some time in the NICU. And you were pretty sick, too. It, that was the complications were 100% me. Yeah. I was sick. So, but this birth was not complicated in the no. same kind of way. No, it was perfectly healthy. Yeah. Perfectly healthy. But a month ago, we were all in super shutdown. Yeah. So tell us about what it was like to give birth to a baby in the middle of all that shutdown. Well... The plan originally was to have family out here to watch our children. And 
being that all of our families in California, we couldn't have anybody travel from California to Texas. So we had to find somebody to babysit the girls. Um, and it was not very fun because once you're in the hospital, you can't leave. So Nate was, couldn't be in the emergency. He, I mean, he couldn't be in the operating room yeah. at all. So I had to do it by myself. And then we had to spend literally two days in a room and could not walk out of the room. Because if he left the room, if he left, if yeah, if he left hospital. the room, he could not come back in. Wow! But everything went really great. Yeah. Right. Didn't get a lot of interaction. The nurses don't want to come into the room very yeah. often. They come in like every few hours and yeah. kind of just say hi, spend a little bit of time, and they're gone. <laughs> right. But Spencer's doing really, really well now. He's really good. Very quiet. Very just a good baby but it's also changed a lot of your other plans so what's it been like you got out of the hospital a month ago now what's what's that been like um no one's got to see him so it's kind of a bummer he's already a month old and literally we're the only ones that spend any time with him yeah so it's kind of unfortunate for him you had family and from california that was planning my mom, to come my mom was supposed to come out and now she had to postpone that and then my mother-in-law was supposed to come out but all from california yeah and one of them is maybe going to come soon. Maybe. I don't know. But we're still, Monday, I don't know. We're still trying to figure it maybe. out. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I really have no idea if she's coming or not. So, so it's a, interesting for all of us, the different experiences that people are having. It's been a pretty lonely and pretty difficult experience. Uh, the last time, you, their babies were in the NICU for nearly a month. Yeah. Yep. And they were separated. And now Spencer's doing really well and really mm -hmm. super healthy. But it's still again, separated. Kind of, kind of separated. Yeah. So it's kind of been a really weird experience. Yeah. So um, at night when you are got your family together and you're praying over your family, what are you all praying for right now? Right now we mostly pray. Well, we pray for all of our individual family members. And then uh, we pray for each kid that they grow up and love God. And this baby is number 31 grandchild, great-grandchild? The 31st great-grandchild is my understanding. That's a lot of great-grandchildren. It's grandchildren. my in-laws, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11th grandchild. Yeah. And That's, then my mom's sixth. Yeah. So when you have a big family and you're really a par apart, kind of what's, what's your support network look like here when you're way away from your family? Um, church friends. Yeah. You and Cindy. <laughs> Number one, you and Cindy. Yeah. And then we have some families that have helped us out, like the Nelson yeah. family have helped us a it's lot. It's a really important time, I would think, to have a community and uh, people around you. Because trying to do this all alone would be really, really Yeah, bad. that's why I believe in finding a church home yeah. like, right away. That was the first thing we did when we moved here was found a church. Because yeah. so, we didn't have church friends. I don't know what. I guess I would have been in the hospital all by myself. Yeah. That's right. Because he would have had to have watched the girls. Well, we're glad Spencer's here. Thanks so Thank much you. for joining us Thank and you. just showing us a little bit about what's going on in your world. Thank and you. we're all praying for you that everything continues to go well and some of your family gets to come see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So I want you girls to know my favorite verse in scripture is um, out of 1 Thessalonians. It's chapter 5, verses... 16, 17, and 18. The verse reads, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I even put a note in my Bible to not ever forget this one because I feel like this is one that tells us that we always need to look to God in prayer about everything. But even in sometimes the worst of circumstances, there's always a reason to be happy. There's always a reason to be joyful. and a river runs through it, Norman's father remarked, I was reading the Bible, and it says the Word was in the beginning. I used to think water was first, but if you listen carefully, you'll hear that the words are underneath the water. In the beginning was the Word, it says in the opening to the book of John. I'm here in our church library, surrounded by books, books reflecting on God's Word and God's world. Psalm 19 tells us God is speaking to us through His Word. It's called His law, statutes, precepts, commands, and ordinance. 
It's perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, and sure. Each word adding layer upon layer, expanding and describing this precious resource. Then David tells us what God's Word does in us. Some people want to use God's Word as if they are magic words, spells and incantations, and that the words themselves carry special power. Instead, the power of God's Word is only understood in conjunction with a willing soul. That is why it falls flat on some people's ears. They read the same words and are repulsed by words that inspire us. These words depend upon you to achieve their power. He says they revive the soul. When a person is depressed and discouraged, when a person is in despair and seeking a new way of life, God's Word has the peculiar quality of causing people to gain new strength. But to someone who has no relationship with God, the Bible seems empty of life. David says that if you have come to the end of your rope mentally, when the complexities of life are too much, when the unexplained tangle you are in, God's Word gives you a new perspective. It makes you wise. This is not about information or knowledge, but it gives you experience gained by God's people over several thousand years. David says God's Word gives us joy. Joy is not happiness. It's not trivial. It's not circumstantial, but the quiet assurance that God is present, loving, and active in my life. It's an unshakable power. God's Word, according to David, gives light to the eyes. There's so much darkness, so many untruths, so many ideas that cloud our thinking and make it hard for us to see ourselves or our worlds properly. We are so distracted and distant that we can become debilitated, but God's Word is like clearing the fog away. It clarifies our decision and guides us in the unknown. We hear what our culture has to say. It's what the common person might think, but God tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Just because people think it's true does not make it true. You, however, can trust God's Word over anyone else to show you the true way to live. David says, God's word is unchanging. That what, that what was true for him is true for us. It was true in Jerusalem. It's true in Athens or Moscow or Melbourne. In verse 9, he tells us that God's word is altogether righteous. God's words are not just good ideas. They're not just beautiful ideas or even helpful ideas. I should not follow them because they make me feel better or they help me to live. He says, follow them even when you don't understand them, even when you dislike them, because they are of such quality that they transcend our ability to understand. Most people have a vision of God that is limited by what they can understand or imagine. They shape God in their own image and think they have God figured out. But Paul has it right in 1 Corinthians. We see through a glass dimly. We don't have a big enough picture of the world. We don't have all the information. We don't have enough experience. And whenever we impose our own limited understanding on the Bible, we get it wrong. Near the end of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln made this next verse famous by including it in his second inaugural address. He was grappling with the awful horror of that conflict and why it lasted and what it meant. And he said, if God wills that this civil war continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another, drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He understood that there was power in the words of God that he could not comprehend, but reflect the nature and character of God. Reviving the soul, making the inexperienced wise, giving joy and confidence, giving light and clarity, giving truth no matter the circumstances, being right even when I'm unsure. That's what God's word is able to do for you today. I want you to know my favorite verse of scripture is 2 Timothy 1.7.
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's my favorite verse because it reminds me when times are hard that I can stand in God's truth and in his strength. God's word 
is compared with two things, gold and honey. One's rare, the other is common. One's hard to come by, the other is in the fields and the forests. Having God's word is like having a gold mine. You can dig in it over and over again and keep exploring the different veins and keep coming up with new truths and insights. Also, it's like sweet honey that fills the mouth. Stop and consider the second image, honey from the comb. It's hard for us to understand the second image, not so much the first one. Gold is still gold, it's rare and costly, but honey is common and pretty cheap and not all that popular. But in the biblical world, it was the sweetener. The average American consumes 57 pounds of sugar each year. We know sweet and we love sweet. In the ancient world, sweetener was rare, rich, and wonderful and getting to have some was a huge privilege. There were two days in the Jewish year that people indulged in honey. The first is New Year's, Rosh Hashanah, and it's a tradition to dip apples into honey and eat them. The apple represents the Garden of Eden and the dream of the way the world could be. Honey is a desire for a new year to be filled with sweetness. 40% of the honey consumed in Israel is consumed in just that week. The second time a Jewish child experiences an abundance of honey is when they begin to learn the Word of God. The one good that may come from our school lockdown is the engagement of parents in the education of their own children. This needs to be especially true of faith formation. I'm sorry to tell you that the church is not capable of discipling your children. In fact, God did not give that task to the church. He gave it to families. He gave it to parents. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. What the Jewish parents know is that the moments to capture a child's heart is the very first moments of learning. Parents too often are waiting for their kids to get older before they get serious about teaching them God's Word. But it's the first moments that build the mental and spiritual structures that develop soul and character. For over a thousand years, the Jewish people have lived as a persecuted minority. One of the ways they've survived is by the passionate commitment to training their children at home through the regular use of repetition and transformative experiences. On the first day that a child begins to learn their letters, at about three, they participate in a ceremony. The parent gets the child and places a slate, one that they use to write letters on, and then they write the letters of the alphabet on the slate, and then they pour honey on it. And then they let them lick the honey off of the slate, and the family reminds the child of the treasure of God's Word. Later, when they begin Torah school, the ceremony is expanded. They're taken to the rabbi, and the letters, and the honey licking is repeated. Like Moses was a mother to them all, so will the quest for knowledge. As Moses says in Numbers, why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Then the child is led to a river. They tell them the study of God's word will never end. It goes on and on. It will be a rich and renewing resource flowing into their lives. I want to ask parents to look into the yellow envelope we sent you and get out the two cards that look like little blackboards. One's for the child and the other is for you. Why not create a new tradition today based on Psalm 19, that learning God's Word is associated with joy, celebration, and fun. Take the laminated card and pour a little honey on it. and then read the card together. And every time you read the phrase, God, your words are sweeter than honey, let the kids lick some of the honey off the page. 
Don't be stingy. Let it be one of the sweetest days ever. Why not do it over and over again as you try to memorize scripture or when you have a family devotion? I was reading about satisfaction and mental health, and I came across a study that compared 22 different character strengths and tried to determine what made the greatest difference between people being satisfied with life or falling into psychological disorders. They determined that the appreciation of beauty and the love of learning were the most significant. That's what my mother's legacy really was for me. It's those two things, the appreciation of beauty and a love for learning. I can tell you that I love life and I think it's because I was raised to see beauty in the world and to have a passion to study all the words, which are God's words, under them all. I want you guys to know what my favorite verse in scripture is. I tell you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. I like this verse because it reminds me that anything and everything I do, God has gone before me. I want you to know that my favorite verse of scripture is Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. The reason that scripture means so much to me is um, life can be hard and it's really good to know that He's got it all under control, that he's got a thousand ways to take care of things when I don't see any way, and that I can just trust him. On Christmas Day, 1937, when my mother was six years old, her daddy gave her a book, Prayers for Little Children. I was looking through it this week and feeling nostalgic and a little lonely for my mom. I was looking through the pages for the obvious signs that she had lived in the book. On the very first page, she had underlined these words, God speaks to me in my mind. At just six, she was beginning to see what David saw. They both know that God speaks to us directly in our minds and helps us to see what he is seeing. We call it our conscience. It's that piece of us that helps to guide between right and wrong. It helps us compare our behavior to the ideal, to the standard. The Psalms says, God, you have spoken in the world, in the sky and the heavens, and that is amazing. You have spoken in your word, and that is life itself. But if you don't speak in me, I'll be lost. God, please look in me and show me what is inside of me. All of us have a basement. It's the not pretty part of our life. It's the part we hope no one sees. We store lots of stuff in our basement. We hold on to the hurtful words said to us, the thing the basement people said to us, you're no good, you're not pretty enough, you're a failure, you're worthless. And sometimes these words come marching upstairs and try to drag us back down into the darkness. That's why David asked God for help, that the darkness does not rule over him, he says. We keep other things in the dark. We keep sin that we're too blind to see. We keep our eyes close to it. Sometimes it's participation in the systemic evil around us, just overlooking what is clearly wrong. David begs God to open his eyes. We also keep our known sin down here. David calls it willful sin. It was no accident. There's no one to blame. It was a choice to reject God. David's list is quite long and ugly. Assault, adultery, murder, deception, pride, disdain. God, I need you to get me out of this pit out of this darkness. Let me hear your voice that I may live. At this time, we're gonna say the Lord's Prayer together. As a family, out loud, I invite you to join with me as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 19 shows us a way to hear God's voice in the beauty of the world around us. It teaches us the eternal value of God's word, and it shows us the way to forgiveness. And then it ends with a prayer, a prayer that God would so speak to us and that we would be so in tune with his voice that what would come out of us would be his voice. Maybe God wants you to make a commitment to him today. Maybe he wants you to pray this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I mean, wherever you are, maybe you should stand up and say the prayer with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. At this time, please take a minute to reflect on the three questions that Pastor Kyle shared during his sermon. So glad that you've joined us today for worship. We're not finished today. Tonight at 7 p.m. at the high school, we're gonna have drive-in worship. Juan's gonna be preaching. We're gonna have a great time. We hope that you'll join us. Make sure you've downloaded the app at My Church. You'll be able to find that information on our website. If you need any help with that, let us know. The words for songs that we'll be singing will be on the app. There's lots of other stuff as we begin rolling out the app. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you have it on your phone. We're not done today either. If you look at the next link tab on the front page of our website, it's gonna take you to a ton of information. There's a matching game, like always. There's links for family activities and stuff for kids. There's my research links that I'd love for you to look at, especially go look at the videos of people in Israel eating apples on Rosh Hashanah. And remember, this Wednesday at 6.30, we're gonna be having a hymn sing-along, and we hope that you'll join us online. And now, wherever you are, if you'll stand up and let's say our motto together. Love God, live like Jesus, Jesus, serve others. Let's go. Let the kids lick some of the honey off the page. Whoa! I don't know what that was. That was bad.